and we've got two great speakers tonight who are going to share their uh, wisdom and experiences around networking and how women network, how it's different for women, um, and how we make connections. So I'm going to begin with um, our first speaker is Dr. Christy Glass, who's a professor in sociology up at Utah State University. She earned her PhD in sociology. That's a hard PhD, for those of you who don't know, <laughs> from Yale University in 2005. Her research and teaching focuses on gender inequality, race, ethnicity, work, and leadership. And her current research focuses on factors that shape promotion opportunities um, and employers' perceptions of women and men. Women and mothers, rather. We all know what people think about men. Anyway, she has published widely in top journals in sociology and management. I'm an academic, so some of this really knocked my socks off. Uh, so she, including social forces, work and occupations, gender and society, social problems, strategic management journal, and human resources management. Her research aims to inform workplace policies and practices and procedures, so looking at those structural and systems processes rather than fixing the women, which I'm a fan of. <laughs> and her research uh, has been featured in the New York Times, The Guardian, NPR, Huffington Post, CNN, and the Harvard Business Review. So please welcome Dr. Christy Glass. Thank you so much. Um, before I get started, um, who are you? Um, how many of you are students? Uh, welcome. Um, how many of you are kind of professionals, current professionals? How many of you are entrepreneurs? How many of you currently hold leadership roles? How many of you want to hold leadership roles? <laughs> Good. Um, uh, how many of you are kind of out of the out of the professional realm right now, but hoping to get back in at some point? Yeah. Awesome. Welcome everyone. Um, what I'd like to talk about is how to make connections. Social connections matter. They matter for all of us. You know this. We just heard this in the talk uh, this evening uh, that preceded this workshop, right? Um, Socially, connections matter. They're what makes life good, right? Connections to other people are what makes life worth living. Um, people who are mo more socially connected are happier and healthier than other people. In fact, one of the strongest predictors of well-being is how well connected you are to others, right? So this is about our health, our well-being, but it's also about who we can become professionally. Connections to others, especially certain kinds of connections to others that I'll talk about, um, pr promote co career advancement, help us a a attain roles that we, that we want, that we value, help us learn about opportunities that we might want to go after, help us share knowledge and information that help other people, because of course our connections to others isn't just about what it does to us, but it's also about what we can provide to other people, right, who, who are connected to us. Being connected to others also increases our productivity, our create, creativity, our impact, our ability to innovate, our ability to do things in the world that matter to us. So if you're like me, as soon as you hear the word networking, you start to breathe a little heavier, you might start to get a little bit of a rash, a little bit of anxiety, your stomach. Is that true for any of you? Do we have any introverts in the room? <laughs> Welcome to the session on networking. Um, I'm an introvert, and so when I hear networking, I think of, I have all sorts of connotations that are deeply unpleasant to me. Standing in a room of strangers and feeling like I have to talk to all of them, right? <laughs> kind of like I'm doing right now. Um, but if we think about network, it's in, networking instead about making connections to others that are meaningful, that help us do meaningful things in the world, I think it helps kind of change the way we might think about what networking means. So I want to do a really brief, uh, um, a really brief exercise with you. Um, here's the situation. This is a kind of a, a, an imagine, imaginary exercise I want you to do inside your own brain. Um, you have a really important project, a project that is deeply important to you, that you've invested enormous time in making successful, but it's in trouble. <laughs> I want you to think of, and, and, and you desperately need an influx of time and money from other people to help 
get it over the hump. I want you to think in your head of five people you could call right now and ask them for money and time. Okay, does everybody have five people you could call right now? Might not be easy, right? But if you thought about it, most of us probably know five people we could call. I would start with my mom, right? <laughs> for example, um, move on to aunts, right? Um, most of us probably have five people. Now, same question, I want you to think of 50 people you could call tonight and ask for money and time. How many of you, th no problem, you've got the list, you're ready, you've got your phone out? Yeah, that's a different question, right? That, that changes everything, right? We all have that tight group, but once you start getting outside of that, things get a little, a little scary. I want to talk to you about two kinds of connections to people, strong ties and weak ties. Strong ties are those people you know really, really well. It's those five people. It's those people that, that um, uh, the president put up, right? Her village, her board of directors, the people who love her, whom she trusts, who can tell her the truth. Those are our strong ties, okay? Those are these people. Those are people we have immediate connections to. We've known for a long time. We've invested a lot of time in the relationship. These are our close, trusted, intimate friends, family, maybe even colleagues for some of you. This is our village. All right. It turns out that compared to men, women have much stronger ties. We're much more likely to have that really strong, cohesive village. Compared to men, in fact, we have stronger, closer uh, 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 networks. Our networks are small, but they're really deep. They're really meaningful. They're made of, up of those people we could call at any time for anything. This is awesome. Again, these are part of the reason, th these are part of the people that makes life good. However, those networks, those tight, tight ties, those strong ties tend to be insular. They tend to be made up of people who also know each other, right? So when we think about drawing on networks for information, for resources, for opportunities, right, it turns out that if we limit ourselves to this group, we're just getting the same information. We're just regurgitating the same information, right, because there's not a lot of new information coming into that group. So it turns out that when we think about using connections or drawing on connections to other people for, for broader opportunities, relying only on those strong ties is not the best strategy. By contrast, men are much more likely to have weak ties. Right? Weak ties are people that you may have infrequent contact, people you know but not very well. These are acquaintances. Right? We all have acquaintances, right? But men tend to uh, draw on those acquaintances much more broadly as a resource. And it turns out that women have disadvantages creating and drawing upon a much broader network. We have, weak, we have strong ties, but not enough weak ties. Okay, these are our weak ties, these are our strong ties. And it turns out that our lack of weak ties really matters. It turns out that weak ties are really, really, really important for professional advancement, for opportunities, for leadership. In fact, scholars believe that women's lack of a broader, weaker, more diverse network is a significant reason why women don't have as many opportunities for professional advancement and leadership. Turns out that weak ties are really strong when it comes to advancement. Why? Well, first of all, there's just more of them. There's just more of them, right? So if you're only drawing on that small village, there's just less information because there's fewer people who know stuff, right? So, th so the wider you're casting your net, the more different kinds of information you're gonna get. It turns out that, as you might expect, those strong ties, those, those small insular strong network ties give us redundant information because as I mentioned, all those people know each other too, so it's the same information cir circulating. Weak ties are different. 
people who were connected to through weak ties, they travel in all kinds of other groups. So our connection with them brings information and opportunities and resources to us from a broader, more diverse cast of characters, right? Weak ties allow, allow us to spread our opportunities and inform to, to gather information opportunities from a much broader, more diverse set of people. Weak ties are especially vital for women. They link, link us to peer and senior women in other realms, in professional realms or, or community realms or leadership realms that we may not have attachments to. Diverse networks, in fact, in some cases, allow women to overcome biases and barriers that otherwise might hold them back. In other words, your connection to this broad network may actually enable you to overcome barriers that you would face otherwise. And our link to people in these broader, weaker network networks um, increase our visibility and help close the gap between men and women in terms of career advancement and leadership opportunities. This is a good thing. Again, weak ties matter. Overall, weak ties help women get seen, get known, get hired, get promoted. So the question for us is, right, if this matters, how can each of us exploit this knowledge, right? How can all of us kind of, now that we kind of know what the research suggests, how can we exploit it? Um, and, and I don't mean just thinking of people instrumentally. I mean, how can we expand our connections to other human beings so that we can help other people and, and those other people can help us, right? How can we expand our reach our, connect, our, our connective tissue, if you will, our social connective tissue, how can we expand that in ways that increase our opportunities, increase our ability to do things that, that matter to us? I'm gonna share with you three really specific strategies and I'm gonna like give you actual like specific marching orders. Here's what you do next, okay? Um, uh, number one, reconnect with dormant ties. Here's a third kind of network tie called the dormant tie. These are people you used to know, right? We all have them, right? These are people, uh, maybe you have a shared history, uh, maybe you were friends back in the day, maybe you were roommates or neighbors or coworkers in your first job, right? Classmates. Um, these are people you used to know, but life got in the way and you kind of lost touch. You didn't have a blowout, nothing happened, right? But you just kind of drifted into your own you know, life. You know, maybe you got married, maybe you moved, maybe you had kids, maybe you got a different job. You drifted apart. These are dormant ties, right? Dormant ties, research finds that dormant ties are actually more useful and more valuable than your current contacts. Why would this be? Well, number one, because of your shared history, there's already trust there, right? This person already knows you. It's not like you're, you're meeting somebody for the first time. This is a person that you shared a history with. They know you, right? They maybe feel comfortable with you. They know something about your past in, in a way that, that someone you're, you're meeting for the first time doesn't. But because you've lost touch, you've gone your way, they've gone their way, it means that they have novel and new and diverse information that you simply don't have. Right? So, so they're not even, you know, if you think of the three layers, the kind of strong ties and then weaker, weaker, they're really weak, right? They're out there not even connected to the people that you know now, perhaps. They've got all kinds of novel information. Um, and it turns out that we are not a good judge of which one of our dormant ties actually may be really important for us to reconnect with. Research shows that we can't judge before we reconnect with them who's going to be valuable and who's not. So cast a wide net. Here's what you do. Ready? Um, homework. Set yourself a goal of reconnecting with at least one dormant tie each month. And this will be fun. This is someone you used to know. This is someone you have a shared history with, right? Just, this is just about, uh, if networking is just about making connections, this is about reconnecting with somebody who was important to you at one time, right? So, so identify, uh, aim to reconnect with at least one dormant tie each month. Make a list, right? And, 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 and once you actually sit down and start writing this list, you will be amazed, amazed at how broad and how deep it is. 
Um, there's a lot of people who are dormant ties for you. Make a list and, and start reaching out. And it's easier than ever now to reach out, to find people on social media, on LinkedIn or Facebook. It's really easy to find these folks. Just do one a month. Meet for coffee if they're out of state. Arrange a phone call or you know an email. Figure out creative ways to reconnect with people who, who were once important to you. And then start asking them, so what do you do? Like, what, what are you involved with? What are your skills? You know, here's what I'm doing. You'll be surprised at what might come out of that. Number two, join new projects or groups. Uh, get out of your comfort zone. The number one way you're going to meet people who are different from you is to go out to places that you don't always go. Right? One way to increase your weak ties is to go out into the world and try something new. Um, so, um, and as I mentioned, network depth and breadth and diversity is really vital for women. So seek out people whom you don't already know who are doing really cool things out in the world. Um, this will expose you not just to new and interesting people, but new experiences, new information, and potentially new skills. So here's your, here's your homework. Um, make a list of things you really love. Uh, make a list of things you've always wanted to do but never done. Maybe you know, you're on some professional track and you feel like you don't have time. Reframe this as part of your professional development, right? Seeking out community groups or, or, or uh, training opportunities or things that you kind of always wanted to do but never made time for. It's time to make time for them because this is part of your professional development. This is part of your professional track. Um, think about what skills you have that you might be able to offer this group or this project. Um, even if your only skill or resource is time, many groups and projects just need people who can devote some time. So even if that's all you have, that's really valuable. Um, and, th and, and then find out what types of projects and groups are going on in your area and your community. Um, I promise you there are amazing nonprofits, uh, organizations, groups going on very near you. And I promise you that if you join, you will meet other kind of amazing, talented people that you never knew before. Um, so, so not only does this expose you to kind of a new opportunity for yourself, for your own personal and professional development, but exposes you to a whole new uh, uh, group of weak, potentially weak ties um, that you can carry forward. And, and so reach out, attend a meeting, volunteer, um, see what kinds of, uh, see, see in what ways you can serve. This also, for me personally, this is also kind of a, 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 a aligns with my need to serve my community, right? So it's it, ser service in, in new areas uh, allows me to meet entirely new people that I would never meet, meet in kind of my everyday professional uh, uh, life. Finally, number three, become a connector. As I mentioned, networking isn't just about what people can do for you. It's about how you can serve other people in your network. Uh, network connections, connections to other people, it's a reciprocal relationship. right? It's not an instrumental one-way relationship. It's not about what you can get from that other person. It's about how you can contribute and what you will benefit from that contribution. Um, so uh, find ways in which you can connect other people. Right? This is a huge, huge part of what networking is about. Find ways to help other people in your network expand their network. Uh, how can you connect people that you know to other people that you know? Because when you're doing that, they're thinking about you and those other contacts that they're engaged with, right? And suddenly, your weak network starts to grow and expand. Here, you know, be authentic. Um, when people see you making an authentic, genuine effort to connect people with similarities or commonalities or you know uh, similar interests, they'll see that and and reciprocate uh, in kind. So here's your homework: make a list of the various people in your network. Who do you know professionally, personally, in your service commitments, in your community? Think about how one person in your network would benefit from being connected to another person in your network and make it happen. Um, introduce, find ways to introduce them. For example, um, host your own event. Invite someone to lunch, 
right? Invite, invite these two people to lunch. Host an event and tell the people you invite to bring another person, right? Invite someone to lunch and tell the, you know, and say you're bringing somebody that you'd like them to meet and ask them to bring somebody that, that you would be interested in meeting, right? We, we socialize all the time. Start to think about your connections to other people as opportunities to be a connector. Um, often, at least for me, um, being a connector is a lot easier than going out on my own and kind of introducing myself. And, and, and so, so think about this opportunity as a really vital way to expand your own network. And let the people that you know know that you'd welcome an opportunity to meet others in their network. Let people you know say, hey, I'd really, you know, I'm really thinking about this opportunity or the next step in my career is this or I'd really like the opportunity to work in this area. Do you know anybody? Think about me the next time you're at this or you're at that. Think about me. You know, is there somebody I should know that you know? Um, put it out there. Let people know that you're a connector, but also you, you'd like to mobilize folks that you know as connectors. The more valuable a network tie you are, the more valuable, the more value, value you will get out of your connections to other people. Right? So three, three, three strategies. Three marching orders, I expect next year at this time, you'll all have much bro broader, weaker networks. Thank you. <laughs> oh, oh, okay. Thank you. So um, there's some good news there for an introvert. I don't know about the other introverts, but <clears throat> I was thinking, huh. so get other people along to invite other people, and so there's less kind of social gluing I have to do. I don't know if anyone's ever looked after one child. It's exhausting. But you have six children. They entertain each other. <laughs> okay? So I like that thinking. That's really good. Um, I also like the connecting with, you know, um, dormant ties, except I might cross up the ex-boyfriends. <laughs> well, the people are dormant for a reason, but really, really useful. We've got lots of homework for this weekend. Thank you, Christy. So next we've got Nyla McBain, and she's the Chief Executive Officer of Better Days 2020, an organization dedicated to celebrating Utah, Utah's women's history by popularizing the past in creative and communal ways. It's going to be fascinating, this is. Through education, legislation, and art, Better Days 2020 is celebrating the fact that Utah was the first place a woman legally voted in the U.S. Did you know that? That's interesting, isn't it? Yeah, I was shocked when I found that out as well. She's also an American writer, especially on topics related to women in the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. She's a blogger and columnist and has been published in Newsweek. I mean, it's top people. Um, Dialogue, uh, a, jur a journal of Mormon thought, Segula, Meridian Magazine, and BustedHalo.com. That's a great name. I love that. I need to be a member of that. There's one of my new groups. <laughs> <laughs> she wrote how to be a 21st century pioneer woman and women at church, magnifying LDS women's local impact, and is the founder and editor-in-chief of the Mormon Women Project, which is fantastic. Okay, welcome, Nyla. Thank you. So I'm actually going to build on what Dr. Glass presented, and I'm going to take uh, an approach looking at the very macro uh, perspective on networking, followed by a sort of more day-to-day -day perspective on networking, and concluding with an in-the-moment, what do you do right at that moment uh, perspective. And I, you've heard all the great research from the professor. You're now hearing from the practitioner who's made lots and lots of mistakes over the course of her career. Um, and so I did have to crowdsource a lot of this material. So I think it's really interesting to see what came back to me. Some of it's contradictory. Um, and so we'll talk about that as we go through these things. But, but building on what Dr. Glass said, this is the macro perspective. And this is kind of both mistakes and things that I've done well. Maybe there's, you see some things on this list that you've done well, some things that you've missed. Um, but for the sake of time, I'm just going to kind of pick a couple here and there to talk about. Um, from my professional experience, one thing my biography didn't say is that I started off in uh, marketing in Silicon Valley, and my whole experience, professional career has been in marketing and advertising. Um, and so after my experience in Silicon Valley, I had children, my husband went to business school, we moved away from the place where I had worked for um, almost a decade, and I had no idea if I was going to go back into that industry 
or if I was going to want to do something else. So you know what I did? Nothing. <laughs> I just kind of waited it out. And I said, okay, well, I'm going to let a couple years pass, and I'm going to figure out what I'm going to do next. But in the meantime, I'll just got be with these cool kids, right? So mistake number one, when I read that book by Sheryl Sandberg, Lean In, the first thi that was the thing that struck me from that is that when I would be had been working in Silicon Valley, part of my brain was always thinking about, when am I going to have kids? And what's that going to be like? And what's my work schedule going to be like then? And then when I had kids, I was like, oh, that was a really nice experience. I'll put that in my journal and move on, right? No, it was a terrible, terrible mistake. Um, have a vision for your future, even if it's not what you did in the past, or even if you don't know if it's really what you want to be committed to in the future. Um, this, is, this was a big mistake that I, I made, and I feel like I've corrected it in a later dec decade of my life, but um, I wish that, that when I was young, when I was some of the ages of some of you students, that I just had a vision or a goal. Let it change, let it be flexible, but, um, but have a vision and, and be working towards that and be fully invested in it um, at all time. These next two are kind of contradictory. I thought these were interesting. One person uh, who I deeply admire and has a wonderful career says, be fully committed to the people you're working with at the time and never think about your next move. Now, I don't think she's talking about your next move within that company. I think she was talking about don't think about, hey, you know, could I get a better offer down the street? But another person told me, spend 20% of your time thinking about your next move. So I think that this, the truth is probably somewhere in between, and I think as Dr. Glass was saying, it is something you constantly want to be thinking about. And some of you, depending on where you are in your profession, you're either looking for a way to move up in your own company, or you're looking to make a lateral move, or, or a, a move to a different company. Um, figure out, be strategic about the amount of time that you want to put into that. Whether it's 20%, whether that seems high or low to you, um, do what Dr. Glass said and always kind of be working on that. That doesn't mean you have to be disloyal to the people you're working with right now. It doesn't mean that you have to have brain share going down the street to that, you know, greener pasture. But it's a strategic decision in the macro perspective to always be considering what that next step will be. Um, I won't talk about this at all, weak ties, because obviously Dr. Glass talked about the, the critical importance of weak ties. Um, uh, but having a plan for maintaining relationships, you know, every, this is going to look, look different for everybody. Dr. Glass pre presented some really great ideas. I had a boss um, 15 years ago now in San Francisco who started his work day by making a birthday phone call. Every single morning we sat down at work, he would call somebody whose birthday it was. I mean, and he had a lot of friends by that point, so we kind of had a person to call every day. I don't think I'd have a person to call every day. Um, and th you cannot imagine the power of this, right? He calls me on my birthday. Like, it, I haven't seen the man in a decade. So, so it was a very strategic decision on his part. And, you know, th thanks to Facebook, it's really easy to know when people's birthdays are. And, and that's not just HBD on Facebook, on their Facebook page, right? I'm talking about a personal, it, it can be an email or it can be a text, but a personal connection to somebody to say, hey, we may have been separated due to, you know, geography or jobs or whatever for, for 10 years, but I still remember you. I still know you. And you know what? When I um, have some, I, he actually is one of the people from my, my San Francisco days that I would feel entirely comfortable reaching out to with any request at this point. There are other people who I, I, I'd be worried that they had forgotten me. I haven't done anything to keep up the relationship, right? So you're like a little nervous, like, oh, hey, you haven't heard from me in 10 years. But, but I would feel completely comfortable um, reaching out to him and he reaching out to me, I hope. And then in the macro, uh, last, my last just practical tidbit from the macro perspective is play the long game. My husband is three weeks into a new job that he has been uh, working towards for four years. Um, he established a weak tie, found this company, knew that he wanted to work for this guy, and it has been four years, and I'm not exaggerating, and it was just a going out to lunch every quarter or so and saying, when are you gonna, when are you gonna hire me? You know, here's what I'm doing now. Um, and, and so never giving up um, it was a theme that I heard cer certainly from the, the people that I surveyed, um, and, and it's certainly been true in, in my own life. Um, so a little bit more of a micro perspective. What are you doing kind of on the day-to-day, week-to-week? Um, again, the goals for frequency and type of networking that have already been talked about tonight are critical. I think the main thing that I want to add here is building on what Dr. Dr. Glass said at the end about making sure that um, 
what, consider what the giver will get from your interaction with them. This was actually a very consistent point that came up from, from certainly my experience and from all the people that I interviewed. Have a specific ask. This is a little bit different than I just want to go out to lunch with you because you're, I think you're a cool person and I want to be a friend, right? This is a deliberate um, approach to say, I have a problem with this or I have a question or it can be as simple as, I just want to know what you do, right? I'm curious, I admire you, um, but we are too busy and professionals are too busy to just be like, hey, want to hang out, right? So, so two, two points, have a specific ask, even if it's something that's a little bit made up or vague, have a specific ask, and then always, as Dr. Glass said, consider what you can do for that other person. Um, if it's connecting somebody to, to your network, if they feel like they can make a great hire. Um, my, my husband is very proud of the fact that within his first three weeks, he has introduced the founder of this company that he's now working to, for to a new finance executive and a new board member. Um, so that, that is tremendous value <coughs> in, its, in itself. Um, I will say, since we're, since we're talking about women's networking here, and since we're living in Utah, and since 43% uh, of male professionals in the United States generally have expressed discomfort in going to lunch or to a private event with a woman, I think that's a really important strategy to have a specific ask. Because what that does is it takes it from a social, I just think you're cool and I want to get to know you, to a very professional business environment. If, if, a, if a man sees you as a professional colleague with professional skills and professional interests and problems, then that perspective of you as a per prospective sexual partner will hopefully go back in the back burner. Because if a man sees you as a prospective sexual partner, first and foremost, that is sexual harassment. But if he sees you first and foremost as a professional colleague um, with whom you know, you, he, can, um, he can have a, a professional experience in a public space, then you can, you're setting the tone for that right away by the way that you ask and the professional nature of, of your ask uh, when you reach out. Um, so in the moment, seize the moment. Okay, so we're kind of at a networking event right now. You, maybe you've gone to some of these groups that Dr. Glass was talking about. Um, here are a couple really th interesting things. Um, the uh, director of HR, who was my college roommate at the, the largest hedge fund in the world, gave me this first uh, point, which I thought was really interesting because I think as women we are especially concerned about being rude, right? We don't want to, we, we don't have the confidence or we just think we're too worried about being nice to say, hey, I'm sure there are a lot of other people here you, you'd be interested in meeting, so I'll let you get to some of these other people, right? Don't be shy about being protective of your time. We are all very busy. The men and women you're asking to go out to lunch with you and to help you and to mentor you, but you yourself are very busy and you come to these events and you wanna make use of your time. Um, and I thought that that was a, a, that was a really good reminder to us that you can be effective um, and uh, polite while still being um, protective of, of your time. This was my dad's, <laughs> my dad's number one <laughs> injunction to me. Find out the color of a person's eye when you meet them. Some of these things might seem kind of silly, but you know what? These, I mean, in the, very, in the moment when you're actually meeting someone or if at an event or if it's for a job interview, of course, these are the things that for better or worse, you know, help create an initial impression. So I've always tried to look, tell the person of a color, the color of a person's eye. Um, dress the part is some, somewhat self-explanatory. This next one, have business cards. I actually heard um, Noel Pocket, who's the president of Utah State University, give this advice to a group last week. This was her one piece of advice to women who um, are, are aspiring um, as leaders. And I thought it was fascinating. And she, she just said her point was that um, it's, it's a physical uh, piece of evidence of your skill set and a reminder that comes up in physical ways uh, that, that, will, um, that will kind of trigger remembrances in the people that you meet in a way that digital communications don't. 
Another person told me that if you do do communica digital communications, make sure you have a filing system or make sure that you consistently label people's names in the company or you say you put in the notes how you know them and then maybe put them in a separate place or a separate file in your contacts so you know who it is that you met at certain events or who, who are your weak ties as opposed to who, who are um, people you know in other parts of your life. Um, and, and so both of those pieces of advice are really about how you present yourself. All of, all of these pieces of advice are about how you present yourself and your personal brand, right? As somebody who's, who's spent my career in marketing and advertising, that idea of the personal brand, I think, um, is, is something that, that often gets maligned. We think, oh, it's all about the way I look, or I have to dress well, or I have to, you know, whatever. But, but this is in the best sense of it. You are creating a brand for yourself in which you can, can be self-aware of your own skills, you can know what you can offer to other groups and other people, you can present that with confidence, you can be realistic about what you can offer, right? If you don't know how to use InDesign, don't say you know how to use InDesign, right? Um, and if you've never done fundraising, don't market yourself as a development director, right? So, so be honest and be authentic, uh, uh, again, as was, as was already mentioned, um, and be be professional, and I think that was partly uh, Doc President Cockett's point with the business cards, um, is that it looks like you've taken the time to assess your skills, to market yourself as somebody who really has something to offer. Um, you know, one of the things that, that certainly I've read in research about men and women in the workplace is, is and you may have heard this before, that, that men have an outsized sense of confidence about how they can take on that green eggs and ham job, right? Um, if you if you present a man with that green eggs and ham job, overwhelming they'll say, "Sure, I can do that." Never done development before, no problem, right? Whereas we women, um, our, our the 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 sort of inherent nature of our personal brands is to be much more uh, reticent and to, to need that um, that experience and that approval beforehand before we take on a green eggs and ham job. Um, and so what happens is that those, you know, those, those big jobs tend to go to, to men who are more cocky about, or about their ability to take that on, whereas a woman who may be just as qualified is a little bit more um, reticent in her self-assessment. Um, so I think, I think this idea of seizing the moment and presenting yourself with a personal brand that is uh, self-aware, cultivated, authentic, and honest um, is, is, a, is a way that we can start uh, addressing some of that discrepancy.